Uh, I guess it's time to start. Um, hi, my name is Michael Bush. I um, work at Twitter in San Francisco, tech lead of the search team there. Um, yeah, and today I would like to talk about our search engine. The um, talk has kind of four sections. Uh, I'm going to introduce a little bit with numbers um, that we have to deal with. Um, then I'm going to cover the search architecture from a high level, and then I want to dive a bit into the inverted index and some of the like ranking tricks we do for um, relevant search. All right, so, um, yeah, Twitter has now more than 255 million active, uh, monthly active users. We have about 500 million tweets every day. Um, we have about or more than 300 billion tweets since Twitter was founded in 2006 now. And uh, yeah, sometimes, probably soon when the World Cup's starting, we, we see new um, TPS, tweets per second records. I think the current one is 33,000 tweets per second. Um, and on the search side, we um, have now more than 2 billion search queries uh, per day. That's has uh, yeah, increased significantly in the last like three or four years since I worked there. I want to cover a little bit the history of Twitter search. So um, in two, uh, before 2008, Twitter didn't really have any search. Um, Twitter acquired a small company called Semise, a small startup with like a few people, uh, who had built um, a search engine on top of MySQL, actually, for real-time search. Uh, they joined Twitter, and first the product looked like this. Before, it was a separate website, basically. Um, in 2010, when I joined Twitter, um, it was already growing so much that kind of the MySQL solution was kind of falling apart. Uh, couldn't deal with the load anymore, um, so we needed to um, change te the technology. And we decided to um, use Apache Lucene, um, but a heavily modified version, which I'm going to talk about soon. Then in 2011, we... Um, made a small change, so the website doesn't look like this anymore, it looked back then like that, um, where we not only could search for um, recent tweets, but also relevant tweets, so we introduced relevant search using Lucene. Um, later, we in 2012 and 13, we added stuff like um, uh, spelling correction and suggested searches. We added type ahead. Um, and here, actually, very recently, if you can read that in the red circle, um, it's a very old tweet. So previously, before 2000, I believe 12, we only had like the last n days of tweets searchable in memory. And um, since uh, last year, we keep adding more and more tweets, so we can almost search all tweets, all 300 billion tweets in history now. And we also added more, uh, we, what we call universal search, um, more result types basically. So now, if you search on Twitter, you get top user accounts, you get tweets. You get photos, vines, videos, that kind of stuff. Um, this is the search uh, left bar on the, on the search web page. You can see that we have um, we have different rankings. Like you can, for for example, for photos, video search, news search. I'm going to cover a little bit why that's different compared to the normal search ranking. We have different search indexes for. Um, for example, for your social graph, so that we can see who you follow on Twitter, and that we, so that we can only return tweets from your followers, or people you follow, I should say. Um, and you have different systems, different search systems, actually, for tweets and users, for example. And here's kind of a summary, um, basically, of what I just said. One thing I wanted to point out, um, which, is, which you can't see in the product, but it's actually a very significant and interesting change to the Lucene community, is that we introduced a new posting list format, I'm going to uh, touch it l later, that, um, is very, that almost fully supports the Lucene spec now. Previously, it was optim highly optimized for tweets, so m mostly uh, usable for short documents. But we changed that such that it supports almost the entire Lucene spec, and that gets us closer to committing it to, um, to the open source project. All right. Let's talk about our search architecture. I think the screen is a little smaller than my... Oh, but I think we can read everything. Um, okay, so on the, on the upper hand, we see we have a real-time stream of tweets. Um, raw tweets and JSON coming in. Um, we have an, 
component called the analyzer. It's called in Lucene the same thing. And the partitioner. What it does is it, it, it analyzes and tokenizes the the tweets and prepares them for indexing. So it creates token streams in Lucene. It does term norm normalization, lower casing, that kind of stuff. It um, also does geocoding. It um, expands URL if they are shortened. Um, and also does hash partitioning. I'm going to show later um, how the index is partitioned. The output of that analyzer, as I said, analyze tweets that are ready for indexing with Lucene. They are stored actually in a thrift. Do you guys know what? Do you guys are familiar with thrift? It's a serialization, data serialization format that uh, Facebook uh, invented and is also open source now. Um, yeah, the partition analyzer uh, emits tweets in serialized format. And the real time index, uh, our name is Early Bird, code name is Early Bird. Um, all tweet systems. Uh, have, have either bird in the name or are named after bird. So, um, our Lucene index is called Early Bird. It's a modified, modified Lucene index optimized for real time search. The key difference is if you are familiar with Lucene, Lucene's near real time feature is that every time you want to be able to search the latest documents that you added to the index writer, you kind of have to, fl you have to call flush or commit so that it actually commits all the data to somewhere else in memory or to disk so that you can search it. So uh, for real-time search, um, for, for very high uh, TPS in our case and QPS, and if you want to have a very short latency between tweeting and being able to search a tweet, that approach doesn't work so well because every time we want to be able to search the latest tweets, we would have to always call commit and that would trigger a flush to disk or, um, or the memory. So we changed that, that we can actually, to the same data structure, append and also search in a log-free way. And in my last talk at this conference, I explained in detail how our memory model and how our um, concurrency model works. So I'm, I can't do it today for time reasons. But if you're interested, then go, go check it out. I believe it's online. And I should say the real-time index is fully memory. It covers the last n days. And uh, it's very fast and uses this early bird technology. So the cluster layout looks uh, like this. So we basically have multiple early bird indexes that are repli uh, replicated n times. Um, they are hash partitioned uh, with a fixed number. I believe it's like 22 or something. So we have 22 hash partitions, I believe, or maybe 25. Um, it's very simple. We just mod the doc ID, the tweet ID, basically, by n to assign it to a, to a hash partition. And then we have what we call time slices. Those are the same, actually, as Lucene segments. So a segment or a time slice is basically its own index that covers a certain time range. And on basically on an early bird machine, the way it looks like is that we have complete time slices that are kind of full and you can't append to them anymore. And the green one on top is the writable time slice. And that's a change I mentioned where you can actually append to the time slice or to the segment and search at the same time and you never have to commit to disk or to, to memory. Um, only when the segment is full and there's some, we have some restrictions of how, how large the segment can get, then we kind of start a new segment, a new uh, on the green, uh, a, new, a new writable um, time slice, and we actually delete the, the segment, the oldest segment on each machine. So it's kind of this rolling window of tweets, so that we always have a constant amount of tweets in this cluster in memory. Yeah, so that's the real time portion of the system the upper part. We have also a kind of offline portion, which analyzes the tweets. Um, sometimes when we have to rebuild it, or also in a daily job, um, from our archive on, on HDFS. It also processes the raw tweet similar to the other um, analyzer and partition, as I mentioned, and also aggregates engagement signals and that kind of stuff. And also does is it doesn't index deleted tweets, of course, anymore. Um, the job is a few days behind, like three or four days behind, because we don't really have to put the most recent days in that archive index because it's already um, searchable in the in-memory index, uh, I mean, in the real-time index. So um, therefore, after three or four days, usually people don't delete like tweets anymore from like a week ago or so. That's why we almost have no deleted tweets in this index, and that's why we don't have to worry about um, garbage collection and that kind of stuff. I mean, deleting documents. 
the archive index is a oh, is a standard Lucene 4.4 index um, right now. Want to upgrade to 4.8 soon? Um, it's reverse time sorted also because even if we um, do relevant search and want to return older tweets, we still the ranking is still heavily biased by time. So we still try to return recent tweets, fairly recent tweets. Um, that's why we sorted uh, reverse by reverse time. And the cluster layout itself is very similar to the memory one, so also fixed number of hash partitions. I think the number is different, and also the number of tweets per machine is different, because we store them actually in, uh, on SSD and not in memory. And cur currently, we actually have two of these archive indexes. One is also in memory. It has a very small, like 1% or something, of all tweets, which, are, which uh, receive the highest engagement, highest number of retweets or favorites, and they are in memory very fast. And then we have on SSD another index that uh, we use as a fallback if um, we couldn't find good tweets in the in-memory one. So if you search for something that's not so popular, maybe. Um, but then the QPS is lower that hits the SSD index. And so it makes sense because the QPS there is limited by IOPS of the SSDs. So um, it's just a cost optimization, basically. Um, one component that I should mention is our Blender. The Blender is a thrift aggregator. So basically, when a search request from a, from a client comes in, it first hits a blender, and the blend, blender fans it out to different system and systems, different indexes, for example, also our social graph or user search index. I mentioned earlier, users are indexed separately from tweets. Um, and also, it knows about our hash partitions, so it can fan out to, to n replicas to get a complete set of results, and then merges all the results together. And uh, depending on what kind of query it was, it's a simple task of just maybe doing a uh, a merge of the search results, of, of a list of, of multiple lists of search resu results, or it's a blending of different result types, as I, as I showed earlier on the slide, where we had you know, tweets and users and uh, videos and images. So then it's a more complicated ranking problem, how to merge results of different types together so that, they, that they're useful. Uh, and then last but not least, we have a, another stream of updates, which is basically when people delete a tweet or they favorite or retweet. Of course, we want to index that too, so that we can use it for ranking purposes. So we have a stream of updates, and um, they are fanned out to all of these early bird index machines. And they actually, we do in-place updates, and I, I can show later how that works. All right. Okay, so I want, to I want to give a very short introduction on how inverted indexes work, because then it's kind of easier to um, explain some of the other data structures later. And an inverted index, index is basically the fundamental concept how Lucene works, and uh, also early bird, because it's uh, based on Lucene. So let's say we have, um, oops, let's say we have the six documents on the left side. And uh, we want to search for words in there. So of course, we don't scan the documents to find the word we are searching for. But in instead, what we build is this inverted index. It's a very simple thing. It's basically a dictionary of all unique terms that are contained in those doc documents. So those, those are the words on the left side. And then we have on the right side what's called posting lists. And posting lists are basically just linked lists that contain the document IDs in which that term occurs. So for example, if you look for the word keeper, you can see it occurs in documents 1, 4, and 5. And then in the dictionary here, we can look up the word keeper, look up the posting list, and the posting list tells us 1, 4, and 5. So it's a very simple operation to look, that word, uh, look up in which documents that word occurs. Um, I want to quickly... Oh, yeah, and uh, one thing I want to point out, we store also per-term metadata in this index. So for example, here it's a term frequency, that just the number of documents in which uh, that term occurs. There's more metadata we need to store per term. And I quickly want to point out which data structure we use for that because of something else I want to explain later. Um, we, unlike Lucene, use a hash table to store all terms because Lucene actually uses a sorted data structure. Uh, for things like fuzzy queries and other query types, you want it to be sorted. We actually don't... Um, 
currently support wildcard queries, for example, or fuzzy queries. So that's why we don't need our dictionary to be sorted. That's why we, um, we have a more memory efficient uh, hash table, or actually an O of one hash table. So as you know, a hash table has to be oversized for uh, efficient uh, hash collision handling. So the array on the left side is basically our hash table. And when we get the first term, cat, we, assir uh, we assign a term ID to this term. It's the first term, so it gets ID 0. ID 0 gets hashed somewhere into this hash table. And the term ID is at the same time the index in those arrays that we call the parallel arrays, because they're parallel. Uh, and the nice thing is that these arrays can be compact. So they can have exactly the size, the number of um, unique terms in our index. They don't need to be oversized like the hash table, because the term ID is, is, an, is the index into those arrays. So if you see three terms, then we append the terms into a, sec a secondary data structure. Um, like a, it's like a string builder, basically, in Java. Uh, it's a character race. And um, we store term metadata into those parallel arrays. For example, the frequencies that I had on the previous slide, but also point us to where posting this starts and like other things we need to keep track of for each term. Yeah, I, but I basically wanted to point out in the slide that we have term IDs, and then that we can, as you can see here, because we have those text pointers into that uh, string buffer, that we could, based on a term ID, actually look up the label for the term. And that's important um, in a few minutes. OK, so the majority of an inverted index is, uh, in terms of size, is, uh, is you need for the, for the posting list. The postings are really huge long lists, and you want to store them very efficiently. So Lucene used to use something called uh, delta encoding. So let's say, or I, it still uses it, but it uses now a different compression that I have on the slide. But um, so for example, if you want to encode the Docker Ds that on the, uh, in the top row, they're 515, 9000, and so forth. Um, those are big numbers. So what we actually try is instead to encode the deltas between two numbers. So for example, um, if you look at the last two numbers, like 100,000 and 100,090, the difference is 90. And 90 is a smaller number to encode. So um, if you have a good compression technique, then it's beneficial to encode smaller numbers. Lucene uses some, or used to use something called VN compression. It's in a newer version. It doesn't uh, use VNs anymore, but it's a little simpler to explain VNs. Um, VNs don't use four bytes for an integer, but a variable number of bytes. And it uses of each byte only seven bits to encode the actual value, but the first bit of each byte stores whether the next byte is part of the same number or if it's a new number. That's why you can concatenate multiple bytes, and it's always a variable length. So in the worst case, if you have a very big number, you could use five bytes uh, for one integer, but um, that doesn't really happen very often in an inverted index, especially because we do delta encoding and we try to keep the numbers actually um, small. Some a, a downside for us at Twitter is that if you have delta encoding, you can only uh, read it uh, from an old to new direction, right? Because each number depends on the previous one, so you have to calculate what the actual doc ID is. Um, but if you think about real-time search, what you actually want to do is you want to return tweets in the opposite order. You want to return usually new tweets um, before old tweets, right? So that's why we wanted to have a different encoding, which you can also use, uh, read in the opposite direction. Um, that's why in our first version of early bird, we had a very, very simple encoding, basically. Each posting had one integer, and we split it up into two parts, 24 bits for the doc ID. And the doc ID is not a delta, it's an absolute doc ID. And since tweets can only have 140 characters, we use the other eight bits for the position of a word within a tweet. Right? And since the eight bits, you can um, encode 255 numbers. That's enough for um, each possible text position in the tweet to encode that position. And then you can, um, if you don't use deltas, you can, use, you can read it in both directions. So we can, we can now read in the opposite direction. If this is a posting list, we can read in, into this direction, new to old. And you can also do something called early termination. So if we don't, if we don't want to actually return, like, let's say, the best tweet of all time, and we really have to read all tweets to find the best one of all time, if we only want to return, which is a very frequent thing we do, especially with API search on Twitter, um, if you want to return the last few results, 
the most recent ones. We can actually, if three, for example, in this case, are requested, we can read three postings and then terminate the search and return them if you can search from new to old. So that's much more efficient, of course, than searching in the opposite direction, so, uh, just to find the last, most recent three tweets. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the combination of searching in new to old direction and being able to do early termination is, was a significant performance improvement compared to the traditional uh, way to encode things. And I said I already talked last year or two years ago about the memory model, so I just have this slide up here because I want to um, kind of give an idea how it works, but not go into much detail. Um, on the top part, it's kind of a little bit like malloc. It um, concatenates, it, it builds up a linked list for each posting. This is kind of a linked list, and each of these green and yellow boxes are just slices of integer arrays. So kind of for each posting, this assigns a number of these slices of these integer ID, um, integer array slices to a posting list, and stores those integers that I mentioned earlier in there. And then it links slices together. What I want to point out here is basically that the postings are stored in arrays, and it's hard. If you would ever want to insert something in the middle, it's extremely hard, because you would have to kind of make room and like push everything away and like uh, rearrange all the IDs if, they, if you want to keep them sorted and insert something. So. Yeah, what I want to point out here is we use native arrays, and it's hard to insert something in the middle, um, but that's a frequent problem of inverted indexes. Okay. So the summary here is of the first version of our posting list format is that yeah, integers can be written atomically. That's another reason we used integers because of our concurrency model. Also, you can see that in my previous talk how the, why that is important. Backward traversal is um, easy. Um, we use integer arrays also for the benefit of reducing garbage collection overhead. And each segment can only have 16.7 mega, uh, million tweets because of um, the 24 bits we use for the Docker IDs. Um, and one thing also here is that the difference to Lucene is that if we see, which doesn't happen in tweets very often because they are short, but if you have, if the same word occur, occurs multiple times within the same tweet, we actually store that posting twice. That's different to Lucene. Lucene does it in a way that it would only store that Docker D once and then encode another number, which is called the term frequency, and that encodes how often that term occurs within the same document. And of course, that makes sense for large documents where it's very frequent that words occur multiple times, but for tweets, they're so, so short that it doesn't really happen very often. Yeah, but for the new postings encoding, we had, um, we had more ambitious goals. We wanted to support 32-bit positions like Lucene, so that um, it's the, we can use the real-time search benefits also for big documents. We wanted to store the term frequencies instead of repeating the doc IDs for space efficiency, because for, again, for big documents, it wouldn't make much sense to do it the other way. Uh, but we want to keep the concurrency model, we want to keep the space efficiency for short documents, and we, of course, we want to maintain the good performance we see. So what we therefore want to do is we want to still store Docker IDs um, in integers because of the memory model that we want to keep and the concurrency model. But now we have the problem that the um, positions and payloads in Lucene can be variable, variable length because you don't know how, how much metadata you have to store if you, if you don't know how um, often a term can occur within the same document. So therefore we encode now the new postings into two different streams. The upper one is um, the upper one, the yellow boxes in the, in the, in the top stream are always 32 bits. They are always fixed size. And they encode the Docker D and maybe the, the term frequency. And they have a corresponding portion in the lower stream, yeah, in the lower stream um, of position payload pairs. Like it could be multiple ones, if the, again, if the term occurs mul multiple times in the same document. And now, um, we don't want to encode the red pointers. So if we actually store for every posting the pointer where the corresponding position payload section starts in the other byte stream, that would be very expensive. The pointer would actually more, would be bigger than the integer itself, right? So that would be not a good idea. So the idea is that we actually use a skip list which is a frequent technique um, that also Lucene uses in, in inverted NICs for two reasons. One is 
um, to speed up searching. And the other one is to actually have these par paradigm points where we know um, where the corresponding section starts in the position payload stream. So we can, if we find, like, we could search for such a blue skip entry in the Docker ID stream, and then we would exactly know where the corresponding um, section in the position payload stream is. So, um, but we have to change our posting as encoding a little bit. And an observation here is that most streets actually don't need all the eight bits for the text position. Because the text position is actually not a character position, it's a token offset. So if there are 10 words in a tweet, then uh, you, you don't store the character offset of the 10th word, the 10th word gets text position like 10. So most of the time, a tweet, of course, doesn't have 140 characters. It could, uh, sorry, 140 different words. It could happen maybe in like CJK languages where we don't have white space um, tokenization and we use bigrams, for example. That could happen that the tweet actually really has 140 different words, but it's not, it doesn't happen very often. So we could get away with less than eight bits in most cases. That's why we use one bit actually to indicate whether um, the text position is inlined in this integer or is stored separately in this other stream that I had on the previous slide. So um, inlining is only possible if all these, um, if all these uh, assumptions are true here. So the term frequency has to be one, which again I said for tweets that's most of the time true, that word only, the same word only occurs once in a tweet. The text position has to be smaller than 127, otherwise it doesn't fit into seven bits. Um, the posting should not have payloads, and in our tweet index we actually don't store payloads right now. And um, for an implementation reason, the posting must not be at the same position as one of those blue skip lists, uh, but that's an implementation detail. So then the cool thing then is that now we can support 32-bit 32, 32 posi positions using the other data structures for, for large documents, but we maintain the same efficiency using the same data structures for tweets, because most of the time for tweets, the, the positions will be inlined in those seven bits, and um, it will not really need that additional data structure in most cases. So we kind of achieved all the goals we had. We wanted to um, keep the same memory model, the same concurrency model, that all works, performance is the same, and actually, uh, after we deployed it, the index size barely increased, increased maybe like 1% because of those additional skip lists. And you can, on, the, on our charts, you cannot even see where we deployed it because the performance was almost identical. All right. And now I want to talk about ranking. Yeah, so I mentioned already that an inverted index, of course, can be used to, if you have a query, you can look up the matching doc IDs. You know, we saw that on the earlier slide. Also, what I pointed out with the term dictionary is that we can do labeling. If you have a term ID, ID we can use inverted index to look up the term label. But um, where do we store stuff like, you know, retweets, retweet counts, favorite counts for ranking? So for that, we have a forward index, and that one is actually very similar to Lucene's doc values, if you're familiar with those. Um, and we have an additional index, an facet index, also similar to Elasticsearch or Lucene or Solar, they have facet counting. Um, we, have a, we, have, we don't have actually the facet counting feature as such, like Amazon or so, on the Twitter search product, but we use very similar data structures for other, for other use cases that I'm going to show in a second. Yeah, so the forward index is very similar to Lucene doc values. It stores tweet features, retweet counts, favorite counts, reply counts, and other ranking information that we use. They are the difference to Lucene is they are in memory and updatable in our case, because I mean, people favorite and retweet like all the time in real time. So we need to update, we need to reflect those changes to um, accurately rank our tweets. Um, and we have a, we implemented a small type system that allows us to pack multiple features into one integer basically. So um, I think for, Retweet, favorite, reply, and then fourth thing that I can remember, we use the same integer, and we use a special encoding to pack that into, into one integer. Because if you think about it, we have 300 billion tweets. That's actually, that's actually the JSON of a tweet here. And you can see there's a lot of numbers in here in metadata. I mean, yeah, a tweet is only 140 characters, but actually the, what's kind of unique, I think, about our search problem is that while we have short, doc, while we have short documents, we have so many that, um, almost the storage of the features for ranking purposes is bigger than the actual inverted index. Inverted index is 
fairly small compared to you know other um, longer documents, of course, because we don't have so many postings. But um, the the forward index needs to be very big. So yeah, if you think about it, if you just want to encode one integer, and if you have 300 billion tweets, you need or in this case, 400 billion tweets, and we have maybe 10, 10 replicas, so I think we probably even have more, then it's already 4 terabytes of memory, which is really expensive. So we, we try to compress as much as we can, of course. So here's our most famous tweet from the last Oscars that got like 3.5 million retweets and 2 million favorites. So these numbers we want to store, of course, they don't fit into one byte. But if you think about it, it's not really important if a tweet got like you know, 1 million or 1, 1 million and 1,000. Retweets for ranking purposes that doesn't really matter. It's more important if a tweet got 10 versus 100 retweets, for example. So we wanted to um, yeah. we wanted to try to pack it into an integer. And um, if you look at different log distributions, if you actually use log uh, the base of 1.1, then we kind of get a nice distribution that um, assigns different values to the interesting areas, right? So, uh, so in this case, oops. In this case, you know, if a tweet has 5,000 or 10,000 tweets, doesn't change the score that much, the log the, in the right column. But if a tweet has, you know, between one and 10 retweets, the value changes like significantly the, the ranking value. So that's exactly what we want to see. Um, th and therefore, we use a, a modified float structure to encode these values into um, seven bits. We only use an exponent for uh, four bits and a fraction of three bits. And you can see that the resulting curve of that custom float looks very similar to that log column here. OK. OK, so now for relevance ranking. As I said, often we just want to maybe return 10 recent good tweets, but sometimes we also want to return the best tweets of all time. And ideally, we don't want to have another index that's maybe sorted by relevance, but we want to use our existing, in existing indexes because um, they're already so, so big and we don't want to build another one. Um, and one observation is that a lot of features are query independent. So we have static signals like maybe the text quality of a tweet, you know, if it has interesting words versus like 10 times blah, that uh, you know, text quality is important. Dynamic signals like number of retweets and number of favorites and that kind of stuff. Or the um, author's reputation, for example, could be interesting. And then there's query dependent signals like Lucene's text score or um, the language of the person who's searching, so you know, for someone who search, who's, um, who's in, in Germany should probably see other results than someone whose uh, uh, language is set to English. Those things, things are very dependent. But there are a lot of um, signals that are very independent. And the idea is to actually index skip lists for documents that have high query independent scores. So we could think of having many different early bird segments or time slices, as I, as I called them earlier here on the lower side that have each 8 million documents. And then we have a skip list on top of them, and the red dots here mark the documents that have a very high query independent score. So those are the, the, the good tweets, right? Um, I'm going to skip this slide. Oh. And furthermore, we can actually have multiple of these skip lists and make them hierarchical. So we can say, you know, on the highest one that has very few of the red dots, those really mark like the best tweets of all time. Maybe the tweet we looked at earlier that it had three million tweets, or maybe Obama's tweet when he got reelected, and that kind of stuff. So they really contain a very small amount of tweets, but uh, and skip most of the other ones. So now, if we search for, if we want to find the best tweet um, ever for your query, we could take your query, inter intersect it with that highest skip list, find a good tweet, and if we, if we find it, we return it. If we don't find anything matching, then we could actually go down a level and go to the less um, um, the, the less selective skip list, search again for your query, and maybe find something then. And then we go, we go d uh, further down until we found a good tweet. Yeah, so um, 
the, the summary here is that we, we, we do this on, a, on an, this relevance ranking on an index that is ordered by time, um, so that we can keep our existing inf infrastructure like appending tweets. But we use a forward index that is updatable to in real time always apply retweets, favorites, that kind of stuff to that in-memory data structure. And then we have a background thread that actually com regularly recomputes those skip lists and reflects the changes of those engagement signals. So the red dots get recomputed all the time because um, tweets can have gotten more engagement in the meantime. And we achieve very high performance um, of in the, with a combination of the skip list and early termination. Okay. Okay, one last thing I want to show is, um, I showed already the universal search slide here, um, because it's universal search, because it blends different result types. And what you can see here is that, uh, for example, we turn photos. So now how do we search for photos, right? Um, I only have five minutes left. Um, how do we search for photos? So we... The interesting thing here is that the, a document in our index represents a tweet, not a photo, right? And now what could happen is, you know, two people tweet the same photo link. Um, the first person says, you know, oh, that's a cute puppy. And the second person says, um, I don't know, cute dog, right? Now, if you index the first tweet with a URL, you only have the word puppy in there. If someone searches for a dog, wouldn't find that document, um, that photo. So what you actually want to do is, you kind of want to update the previous document with the photo URL, so that it also contains the word dog. But as I showed earlier, in an inverted index, it's very difficult to in-place updates. So that's why, and especially in the real-time index, if you have an offline index, you could recompute the whole index um, often, but in a real-time index, um, you don't want to do that. So, and also, especially on Twitter, it's very important that you can often find very recent photos, for example, if they're in San Francisco next to our office, there was a fire recently, and um, the, the, the photos people took on the street with their iPhones showed up on Twitter before anywhere else. So you really want to solve this searching photo problem in real time. Yeah, but because in-place posting is updates are, are hard, and Lucene's update document call is really delete and add, so it changes the order of the index, so it would not preserve our time order index anymore, we needed a different solution. And the idea is to use facets actually for that, and the facet data structure, not the facets in the product sense. And this is how it works. Um, again, the facet index is basically an index that maps from a doc ID to the features a tweet contains. And features in this case could be photo URLs, could be hashtags, could be ad mentions, um, or other uh, interesting entities. So now if we, if we search, if you search for a query, we look in the posting list, we find the matching doc IDs, and then we look up in the facet index, what are term IDs for interesting entities like photo URLs or hashtags that the stream co tweet contains. And then we have a, we maintain during the search a top K heap that um, has the tuple of, N of the term ID that we found in the tweets that match the query, and the frequency, the count, how often that um, term occurred. And as I pointed out earlier, uh, we can use the inverted index to map back from term ID to the term label using the dictionary implementation we have. So um, the last step after we found the top term IDs by count and have sorted them, we can use the inverted index to map them back to, um, in this case, photo URLs and return the top photos actually that match your query. And it's, this is kind of cool that we can use the normal inverted index and don't have to build a special index and solve the, the you know, up, in, uh, updatable document problem. Okay, so in summary, um, as I said, indexing tweet entities um, allows us to search in a, in a tweet-centric index for other entities. All query types are supported. For example, you could say, find the best photos in San Francisco you know, from people I follow. Um, Documents don't need to be re-indexed, and the approach is reusable for new entities that come up. We just have to change our indexing schema um, for like best vines, hashtags, mentions, videos, that kind of stuff. And I believe that's it. Yeah. Questions?
I think we don't have too much time, but... Thanks for the talk. Um, how do you do um, type ahead? Um, I'm sorry? How do you do type ahead? Type ahead? Do you have different um, index? Yeah. And, uh, one more question, how do you do spell correction? Yeah, so um, the question is, how do we do type ahead? It's, the answer is that's actually another index. <laughs> it's not, it's not um, served by these indexes here. And um, it's pretty similar to how Lucene does type ahead. Um, we index prefixes of terms, and then we query that index for term prefixes and, and can expand to the, the actual queries. Spelling corrections? Um, it's also like a whole, uh, it's another, <laughs> another different index actually. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's not, it's not served by these indexes that I mentioned. Any more questions? So uh, I'm going to continue your real time uh, talk, but uh, I think in the Lucene 2.9 there was already a real time support. So could you just maybe a few words how your approach is better? Yeah, the, I think the question is, um, why don't we use the near real-time feature that Lucene 2.9 introduced? Yeah, I, I tried to touch on it earlier. Um, the, 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 different, the reason is that for, it, it work, so Lucene's near real-time feature works well if you don't reopen your index reader too often. So you have to, in Lucene, you have to reopen your index reader to see a fresh view of your index. Yeah, um, you, 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 have, you have to, you, um, implicitly Lucene does that. Lucene has to flush all these data structures that I had here on the slides, like the, the posting lists and dictionaries, it flushes it to disks or to, disk or to a different in-memory um, directory implementation. And that, op and that causes new segments, small segments, a lot of small segments, especially if you do it very often. So you pay later for merging those small segments. Right. So in, in Lucene's near time, uh, near real time search feature, the indexing throughput and the search throughput are correlated. In our case, it's completely separate. So we can, uh, because we never have to flush these data structures, we never get small segments and we never have to pay for, for merging segments. So if you look at the performance curves, like you could, you could have an early bird machine and you index as fast as you can with like, I don't know, 50,000 tweets per second you index. Um, and then you start hitting it with queries, right? And the indexing performance doesn't go down at all. It's completely, completely maintains the same um, performance. Thank you. Okay, maybe we have time for one more question. Could you give us some idea how you test um, your system, so both on, on the micro level for, for um, for your Lucene modifications, as well as the how you test like the full system. Yeah. So for yeah, the, the question is how do we test the system? On a low level, <coughs> actually the cool thing is even though some a lot of the data structures in early bird are different from Lucene, the cool thing is they implement the same Lucene APIs, which is why I was lazy and just used a lot of the Lucene unit tests <laughs> to test for the correctness. And that's uh, um, that there's really great coverage we have. Um, we wrote additional unit tests to test specifically the, the concurrency, uh, the new concurrency model. But otherwise, we for just correctness of searches, we we use a lot of the Lucene unit tests. And then for the system as a whole, yeah, it's always difficult to, to fully test the distributed system. We have um, we have um, uh, smoke tests that hit our Blender component and um, test if the expected search results. You know, from for example, if you test if you have if you have a fixed data set and you um, do a universal search query, it hits almost all the systems. So if you get the expected result back, that's a pretty good indication that um, you know, nothing fundamentally is broken. Um, also, we have so many queries. We have constant stream of, a stream of queries that a lot of um, things we test when we, when, we, uh, for, when we deploy, when we do a staging deploy, we can you know, send a lot of queries to the index um, and, and see if anything is breaking. So that's, that's a benefit that we have such high traffic. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much again for your talk. Thanks. <laughs>